ക്യാമ്പസ് and we can see that so many alumni members have also joined and it is actually a get together of all the alumni members i feel privileged and honored by presence of uh, professor kg suresh in this uh, talk series where we are planning a series of so talk as a celebration of 50 years of our department so on behalf of uh, department of physics of kg suresh okay. kerala i officially okay. welcome i okay. hand over the session to savitha madam to okay. introduce the speaker moderate the session savitha madam please okay thank you sir very good morning to all here uh, this year department of physics university of kerala is celebrating its 50th anniversary on this occasion it's been an honor for us to interact with uh, uh, professor kg suresh sir i thank today's speaker professor kg suresh sir ready accepting our invitation uh, now i request arati ar research student to formally introduce our speaker over to you arati good morning all honorable speaker of the day professor kg suresh our beloved head of the department dr cb ks respected faculties and dear participants today we all are here to attend the talk of professor kg suresh head of the department of physics iit bombay on the topic spintronics and topological matter now let me speak a few words about him he graduated and took masters from university of kerala and has been awarded phd in physics from iit madras later he joined iit bombay in 1998 and currently he is professor and head of the physics department his area of research is condensed matter physics in general and the specific area covers magnetism and spintronics he has guided 15 phd students and has authored more than 200 publications He has received the Materials Research Society of India medal in 2019 and the Department Award for Excellence in Teaching from IIT Bombay in 2020. He is also a senior member of IEEE. In today's talk, he will be presenting for us the basic ideas of spintronics and topological matter. he will be highlighting the importance of these topics and the need to identify novel materials belonging to these classes finally he will be discussing some of the results of his research group on these topics now it's time for us to listen to his words let me invite professor kg suresh to address the audience thank you so uh, outside let me take few minutes to uh, talk about my association with the department first of all i thank savita especially because she has been uh, i know her uh, for a long time she happens to be the student of my classmate and friend santosh who addressed the students i think very recently therefore when savita uh, invited me i could not really uh, kind of uh, ignore the request and therefore i accepted it and anyway i was ready to talk to the department i visited the department i think uh, maybe 3 4 years back that was a physical visit unfortunately that is not happening and therefore we are having this i am very very happy to uh, in fact other day we were discussing we have a whatsapp group i am very happy that uh, some of my classmates are here and we were uh, really cherishing the moments that we spent in the department long back i think our uh, batch was a very noisy batch of course it was not a troublemaker batch and uh, we really enjoyed the stay of two years there 
and then i think many of us have gone to physics watson is here meena is here i could not see other people so sandosh of course is a very regular visitor to the campus it was very very nice that uh, we could really spend uh, some fruitful years in the campus and i'm very happy that even now the tradition is going on and uh, you are celebrating this 50th uh, uh, anniversary of the department in fact the uh, vela university also arranged some alumni meet and so on so whenever i get time i was uh, attending the functions and talks and so on so it was uh, it is very nice to be uh, at least remotely back to the campus and address uh, the students i understand that the audience consists of uh, mostly msc students and the phd students i mean audible sagita yes okay yeah so okay. i will yes, talk yes, about yeah okay okay so uh, in fact i got a mail from professor unikesh nayar uh, sir yesterday night uh, that uh, he was our course coordinator uh, long back when we were students and he has some engagement and he could not attend this talk today but it was very nice to see his email and then he mentioned about professor rao and i i remember all the teachers who were there at that time uh, professor ridas so many other people who were who were really stimulating our interest in physics and uh, well helping us to uh, pursue our career in physics thank you all so with these few words of uh, kind of introduction back uh, let me talk about the topic in fact dr joe sometime back uh, invited me to give a talk i told him that the, the only problem for me is that the topic that i generally work uh is not very much pursued uh, by people in the department therefore whatever i am talking may not be very very appealing to the audience but still uh, i thought okay i can try and especially for the msc students to get to know what is going on especially in the field of condensed matter physics it may be useful people who are already in the phd program this may not be very useful but still you can get to know what is going on so my talk will not be very very useful for the general audience i will try my best to make it general but i may not be very successful so i am talking about two things which are related one is spintronics and other thing is topological matter as uh, many of you know uh, spintronics is uh, a recent topic maybe last uh, 10 15 years people talk about spintronics and today spintronics actually is applied in the sense that we are using we are getting the benefits of this field topological materials uh, it is uh, much more recent and people are uh, very much attracted or fascinated by this field and uh, many things are not yet understood and many things which we are talking about in topological condensed matter originally they are coming from high energy physics now so the concepts came from high energy physics and therefore uh, it is kind of a reunion uh, in the sense that uh, some of the old things are getting back in a new avatar in the sense that it is condensed matter which is helping to realize some of the hypotheses which were uh, done for the high energy physics so i have given uh, two things here when I, if i came there physically i would have got this uh, medugada and this one so it is not that i am making a joke here i will tell you why i am showing here it has something to do with the topology that i am going to talk about towards the end and here i talk about spintronics Spintronics, as, as you can see, basically we talk about or we give more emphasis on the spin of the electron. So with this, uh, let me give you what is the plan of my talk. I will give you a brief introduction to magnetism and magnetic recording. That's the only way I can start off. Then I will give you some ideas of spintronics and different kinds of spintronic materials and the one set of alloys that. i have been working or my group has been working for the last uh, uh, 10 years or so then from there during the discussion of some of the results that we have obtained recently i will really switch over to the topological uh, aspects or topology in condensed matter and then i will also try to give you as i mentioned just now i will also try to give you why this is important or what are the future perspectives so one of the important things that i am going to highlight at, at least in the first part of the talk is uh, about spin a spin probably is one of the terminologies which is highly misused 
because of this usual way we define in the schools itself uh, spin is something like a self rotation uh, completely forgetting the fact that electron or proton or any such quantum system is completely quantum mechanical and therefore this kind of a uh, planetary model kind of a situation is absolutely an analogy is absolutely wrong and that is what actually is getting into our mind even when we are very small so it's very difficult for us to decouple from that wrong concept and that actually creates a lot of issues as we teach or as we try to learn more and more uh, advanced topics so what is importance of spin spin of course as you know the fundamental particles have spin and based on spin only we classify particles into two categories one is a set of uh, integer uh, spin particles they are called the bosons and the other is half integer which is the fermions so essentially we can classify any particle <coughs> in the universe to either bosons or fermions so uh, and as you know both the uh, photo uh, the uh, bosons as well as fermions have spin for example electron proton neutron they all have spin half particles that is why they are fermions then uh, photon for example or phonon which are bosons have spin half uh, spin one so what happens is people have been worried about uh, quantum mechanics of course but most of our studies most of our textbooks uh, the preliminary textbooks of quantum mechanics and so on we completely ignore spin and that is why we actually get into this field of uh, electronics for example electronics talks about how one can manipulate the electron flow completely forgetting about the fact that it has got another entity called a spin so what has been realized in the last uh, decade or so is that if you actually include the spin also spin degree of freedom also into the concept one can actually get many functionalities and that is what the best example for such a thing is nothing but the spin tronics as this slide shows so you can actually think about an uh, electron with its charge if you can really couple with the spin you actually see that the schrodinger picture or the schrodinger equation changes over to dirac equation similarly one can actually think of uh, bringing the photon which has a helicity operator or a helicity property that, that again is connected with the spin of this uh, photon for example is a boson and one can relate with the spin of the electron which is a fundamental particle so one can have such a coupling and then you actually see that your selection rules change that you give right that gives rise to magnet optics and things like that which again are very important in the field of spintronics itself similarly one can have electronic charge and it can be controlled or the motion can be controlled by controlling the helicity of the photon so all these mutual couplings are possible only because you are trying to realize or trying to acknowledge the fact that electrons and photon in this particular case both have spin of course one is a half spin and other thing is a half integer spin other thing is a integer spin so if you really bring in the spin into the picture you see that things are very different and you can get many more applications very interesting physics possible so this is a slide which actually shows you that if you really want to separate spin of course you can separate spins usually when you talk about a spin half system like that of an electron you have a spin up and spin down which are the projections of the spin spin of course is half it cannot be negative the spin quantum number is positive but what you talk about with respect to the up and down arrow that is nothing but the ms value which is a projection along the axis of quantization which is uh, plus half and minus half so one can actually separate this in terms of energy by the standard method is to apply a magnetic field that is nothing but the zeeman effect where you can see that one spin is down and other thing is up in the energy level so this is energy wise separating the spin up and spin down electrons one can also recently people have found that it is also possible to spatially separate something like this with the help of a thermal gradient etc one can actually physically spatially separate not only in terms of energy but also in terms of space so all these things are needed when you the moment you try to realize that okay i have to use spin all these issues come to the fore in the sense that i have to separate them i have to really physically separate them i have to uh, separate them in terms of energy and so on so this is one of the important aspects one has to worry about another very important aspect is what is uh, again taught in all uh, basic courses is spin orbit coupling spin orbit coupling plays a very very important role uh, uh, both in spintronics as well as in the topological materials as we are going to see so spin orbit effect is very important and i will show some examples why this is important and how it actually is playing the physics today 
I hope I am still audible, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So let me again start uh, with. Uh, uh, I mean, I am going to talk mostly on the materials aspect. So let me give you some, or let me kind of give you some uh, chance to recollect whatever you have studied. Nothing new, because I am going to talk about different classes of materials. Therefore, I should give you a basic introduction to such materials and the classification. So as you know, that you start with an insulator. Insulator is typically in a very simple picture is something like this. You have filled bands. And there are gaps. These gaps are generally very uh, large. These energy gaps. Whereas all these bands, which are there, all of them, whatever is a band, it is completely filled. On the other hand, metal. Again, a usual uh, wrong concept is that metals don't have energy gap. That is not really true. Metals also have energy gaps, exactly the way the insulators are. But what is different is you have at least one band where there are some holes in the sense that it is not completely filled like this. So when you apply an electric field or you try to heat, what is possible is that these electrons here actually can go within the same band without encountering an energy gap. They actually can get excited and therefore there is no real extra energy required and therefore it is a conductor. So metals also have energy gaps exactly the way here, but the difference is that they have incompletely filled bands. Another thing which is, okay, then let me go to the semiconductors. Semiconductors, more or less same picture, but so, small difference is there. You can see that the gaps available in a particular uh, band is small, and some of them are actually getting excited. Some of the electrons, whichever is supposed to be here, they are excited to the next band, and therefore you see that there are some unoccupied states here, whereas there are occupied states in the next higher uh, band. So that's a difference, and this, this is nothing but a very small energy gap. This energy gap is what is encountered as, as the electron gets excited. Another very important class which is uh, coming into uh, the picture recently, which was not very useful, at least uh, till now, is what is known as a semi-metal. What is a semi-metal? Semi-metal is something which is shown here. Again, you can see that it is at the Fermi level. This is a Fermi level where we are all interested because most of the uh, properties are essentially governed by the electrons at the Fermi level. You can see that you have electrons and holes playing a significant role in the conduction and other properties. So you can see that this is an insulator where energy gaps are very large. Here is a case which is a metal where you can get uh, electric current, you can have conduction possible by having small uh, electric fields because they are essentially within the same band only. And semiconductor, you have already at a finite temperature, you have some uh, electrons already getting excited to the next uh, uh, higher band. Therefore, you have electrons and holes. And the semi-metal is one where you have actually an overlapping energy-wise, both these two bands, the holes here and the electrons here, they have the same energy and therefore you get an enhanced electrical conduction and so on compared to what is happening in the case of a semiconductor. Okay, it is uh, experimentally speaking, it is easy to distinguish between an insulator and a metal, no doubt, even with the help of a, as you know, with the help of a multimeter itself, you can actually tell okay, whether it is a metal or an insulator. But the same thing is not possible between a metal and a semiconductor. You need to do some electrical conductivity measurement and try to find out what is the temperature dependence. Then only you will be able to tell whether something is a metal or a semiconductor. Distinguishing between a semi-metal and a semiconductor is even more challenging. Because the, the picture that is shown here, you have uh, both these carriers, except that the energies are different in one case and uh, other case energies are more or less same. But it is extremely tricky to experimentally tell that this is a semi-metal or a semiconductor. As we go along, we will see some of the experimental problems associated with this. So if anybody has a serious uh, doubt or anything, please uh, stop me. I will be able to answer uh, during the lecture itself. Okay. As far as the uh, condensed matter uh, topic is concerned, it is the first important thing that one has to realize is the band structure, which is nothing but the dispersion relation, that is uh, energy and uh, K, moment, K actually represents the momentum. So EK diagram will give you some idea about the conductors and insulators and the classification and so on. So start with a conductor, you can see that it's a very simple case. It's a parabolic band. You can see that this is the highest occupied level, nothing but the Fermi level. Let me go to the insulator where the gap is very large, as I mentioned earlier also. And the semiconductor, the gap is very small. At the Fermi level, one can actually have thermal excitations if the temperature is not very low. 
and that is why we have most of the uh, semiconductors uh, giving reasonably good conductivity even at room temperature. Then you also have this is a wide band semiconductor, this is a narrow band semiconductor. Of course, there are other classifications of direct band gap and indirect band gap and so on. I am not going to those details. And then, of course, as I mentioned again, you can see that a semi metal where at the Fermi level you have electrons and holes at the same more or less at the same energy, that is what is making it different from the even the narrow uh, gap semiconductors. Now, it's also possible that uh, you see these are all parabolic bands. In fact, you can see all these are parabolic bands except this one. This is zero gap. You can see that the gap is between the valence band and conduction band is exactly zero. That is number one. Number two is that it is not a parabolic band. It is actually a linear. The dispersion is linear. E versus K uh, relationship is linear, unlike the quadratic dependence here. So this is linear. Of course, uh, people who are working in graphene will know that this is something what is happening in the case of graphene. So there are two points associated with this because I am mentioning this and because I'm coming to this little later. It is a zero gap. Uh, semiconductor if you want to call that way but more importantly it is also having a linear dispersion now i will just tell you some of the terminologies which are important when you talk about uh, these noble materials uh, you keep hearing these material uh, terminologies as and when you re re look at the literature and so on or even if you do a simple google search many of these things will come up so on is as i mentioned it's uh, topological materials so certain kind of materials, I will go into the details uh, very soon, therefore I will not be uh, defining it right now. There are uh, some kind of a special materials and the properties of these materials are very much associated with the topology of the material itself or the topology of the structure or the topology of the band structure itself. Therefore, the interest is that because of these things are uh, not known for a long time and this is somewhat new of, or it was kind of understood little recently, therefore uh, this has become a very important uh, thing today and it has got a lot of applications if uh, whatever we think will happen definitely the application potential is huge uh, they are also called the quantum materials again i i really don't like this uh, terminology quantum materials because any material is quantum mechanical in that sense you cannot tell that okay only these kind of materials or this set of materials is quantum mechanical quantum material that's not really the correct terminology but somehow the name has got stuck now therefore one has to live with it so here what is meant by a quantum material is that the electron correlations are very, very strong like magnetism, for example, or superconductivity. As you know, the electron correlation is extremely strong and it is a very, very strong cooperative effect. And therefore, such materials where this effect is very, very predominant compared to any other interaction, such materials are called quantum materials. Other thing is emergent phenomena. What is emergent phenomena? In the microscopic scale, uh, the, if you really look for uh, some of the properties, they may not show at all. The same system, if you look at macroscopically, you will see that it has got very, very interesting properties which are not or which are completely absent in the micro scale, microscopic scale and such properties are called uh, emergent properties and such phenomena together is called the emergent phenomena. I will again come to that as I go along. Then comes a very standard thing is quasi-particles. Quasi-particles are again very uh, you often used these days. A simple thing that you one can give an example of uh, quasi particle is something like the effective mass which we talk about. When you have a periodic potential, you know that electron has masses which can be very, very low compared to the free electron mass or it can be even 1000 times the free electron mass. So the variation of the mass is some at least something like uh, 6 or 7 orders of magnitude or many times it can be even more. So this is a simple example of a quasi particle. So you can think that electron which is having a, something like 100 times uh, usual mass of the electron is something like a quasi particle how do you define quasi particle you have so many interactions in the system at the same time you want to treat it as a single particle completely forgetting about all the interactions what you have to do is that you have to completely forget about the original properties of reason for example when you talk about electron mass here you cannot really think in terms of the usual mass of the electron the free electron mass but you have to think that it is having something else it can be very very unphysical to so to say like as I mentioned, it can be even 1000 times the mass of the electron. So this is possible because you are actually trying to give all the other interactions which are responsible for uh, the electron to get dragged or whatever. So in terms of this mass, so mass essentially represents in some sense the interactions which are uh, uh, to which this electron is subjected to. So all these interactions together in, in the presence of this interaction, this particle will behave 
as if it has got a mass of this one. Oh, so therefore, this can be treated as a quasi particle, and a quasi particle is not restricted to have only the standard uh, electric charge or standard mass. Therefore, it can have uh, even the so to say unphysical electric charges or masses. Similarly, one can have uh, a collective excitations. I am going to talk about. So uh, mostly the low energy excitations again in the presence of several interactions. Some of the interactions can be very very important. In such cases, one can still think in terms of single particles. But what happens is you, the single particle behavior has to reflect all the interactions to which this particle is subjected to. That gives rise to what is known as collective excitation. For example, uh, again, a simple example is photons. For example, or I mean phonons. For example, uh, a standard thing that we study in quantum mechanics uh, or in condensed matter is something like photon or a phonon. Where we can a phonon, for example, is very important. Uh, to tell in terms of uh, collective excitation because it's an excitation of the lattice which is called a photon a phonon so some of these topics will come as i go along and therefore i thought i will mention and this as the slide shows there are many things that are possible with the quantum materials or this emergent phenomena there some phenomena are written here some uh, uh, properties are written here some applications are also written here for example you see qubits the teleportation all quantum computing all these things are really really coming up and all over the world there is an initiative to go for such quantum technologies in that such technologies naturally the quantum materials or the topological materials will play a significant role okay now let me come to the beginning of spintronics that actually has to start with magnetism and magnetic materials something which many of you will know from your early days of high school itself you may be knowing about this typically you talk about magnetic ordering in the context of ferromagnetism anti ferromagnetism and ferri magnetism so these are the three things where one can see that there is a magnetic order in the sense that start with ferromagnetism that you can see that the spins or the moments i should not really use the word spin alone because there is an orbital contribution also in general so the, these are all magnetic moments let me not tell that they are spins these moments are getting aligned in a particular direction i am giving rise i am giving the ideal situation and then one can have anti ferromagnetism which is again an ideal anti ferromagnet then you have when you have two different kinds of magnetic species in the same material you can have an anti ferromagnetism something like this but since the magnitude of the moments are different they may not completely cancel and this gives rise to an arrangement of this kind which is known as free magnetism ferrites are all known for this kind of thing and of course uh, all these three classes are uh, studied or taught uh, in earlier classes the beginning of the all these things is nothing but a paramagnetism where there is a thermal energy which will overcome the inter any kind of interaction energy among the spins or uh, the magnetic moments and therefore there is no ordering this is not an ordering and people also thought that in the earlier days people thought that only magnet ferromagnetic materials and ferri magnetic materials to some extent will be useful for any application people completely forgot about the anti ferromagnetism the situation today is not really true as i am going to show you anti ferromagnets also play a very significant role in many applications including spintronics probably much more in spintronics these are all magnetically ordered well known uh, cases textbook examples if you see here here also you can see some kind of an order only thing is that the order is not the kind of order that you are seeing here or here here what is happening is something like a helical order something like a spiral order or some kind of a repetition that is happening all these things are also uh, should be called a magnetic order this this kind of an order uh, in fact it was not even probably acknowledged as an order earlier and therefore people did not really this remember these are all spatial arrangements in real space i am talking about real space arrangements of magnetic moments in both these cases so such an arrangement was kind of forgotten or people thought that okay it may give rise to only some interesting physics interesting magnetic aspect nothing more no application this was the thing that was uh, people thought uh, till a few years back very recently people found that that is not really the case and one can actually see some kind of an application very important applications which is again topological if you really see as i am going to show you later so this has also become very important which is a topic which was kind of treated as a purely a fundamental interest has no application potential which is now going to be rewritten the story is going to be rewritten now another thing which is not really uh, taught in uh, even in an msc class is when you talk about magnetism in metals things are slightly different because metals if you want to really talk about you have to talk in terms of the energy energy bands of course insulators also have energy bands as i showed earlier 
but here the picture is very very important because you have to really know the density of states of electrons at the fermi level because I, I, you know, I mean since it is a metal you know that it is going to have a thermal conductivity electrical conductivity and so on all these properties are going to be determined by the density of states at the fermi level therefore it is important now the usual band structure when we teach or when we study you really don't worry about the spin of the electron we simply treat charge as the only parameter of the electron and therefore we really do what is known as an unpolarized band structure calculation or un unpolarized band structure what is needed in the context of as i mentioned the inclusion of spin one has to treat the band picture in the polarized context so polarized means you actually are distinguishing between the spin up and spin down electrons so that is what is shown here i will not go into all the details of this you can see that you always try to distinguish between a up spin band and a down spin band this is very important this is not the case when we really do a normal band structure if you take any solid state physics book you will not see this kind of a picture unless you are actually talking about magnetism otherwise you are happy that you just take the parabolic band for example in the earlier picture i did not really put the arrows up and down just because it was a simple band structure we talk about or we assume that they are degenerate the up spin and down spin sub bands are degenerate in the absence of an external magnetic field or in the absence of an any internal magnetic field that means the material is not really magnetic in that case you are okay to have an unpolarized band structure uh, picture and you can go ahead but the moment you bring in spin and you, that means you are actually telling that at least there is an internal magnetic field in such a case even if it's a paramagnet in such a case you can have a small even a small interaction is enough to lift the degeneracy between the spin up and spin down if you want to call the bands and therefore the picture has to be something like this therefore since there is an energy difference between the spin up and spin down bands remember this is a very important point here because i cannot really talk in terms of the total electrons i have to really distinguish these total electrons in terms of the spin up electrons and spin down electrons in some sense uh, spintronics actually starts here you have to really distinguish between the spin up band and spin down band so i am going to ju not just see the electronic charge but i am also trying to associate the spin of it this is very important because i will now tell okay this is, there is a spin up electron going or there is a spin down electron coming i am not telling unlike electronics where i am simply telling that okay this electron is moving with this kind of velocity this is getting subjected to a force because of there is an electric field all these things now things are different now we have to really talk in terms of whether that particular spin we are giving one more address to the spin we are telling that okay not only that it is an electron but it is a spin up electron or a spin down electron this is really really important to appreciate what actually happens in the case of spintronics number one number two again is that since you are talking mostly on metallic side metals you cannot really talk in terms of one or two electrons you have to talk about all the electrons which are there in the conduction band for example all the electrons in the conduction band what you have to do is you have to separate them or classify them into two groups one is the spin up electrons and other thing is a spin down electron so this usual way of putting this arrow picture which i showed you earlier where every side i have up and down arrow that picture strictly speaking is not really true because now these electrons are to some extent mobile not like an insulator therefore these electrons are uh, in a position to move therefore fixing or localizing them to a particular site may not be really true that is why you purely uh, i mean you take the whole electrons into two groups and put in them in bands and as far as it's a band there is no problem because band is something where uh, conduction band is possible and therefore the uh, metallicity can be preserved and so on therefore you will not be using this picture of this uh, up down up down or anything you simply treat the whole conduction band to be split or to that uh, for that matter even the 3d band which is a magnetic band so to say which actually is in some sense contributing to some kind of conduction also as you can see that at the fermi level there is a contribution there is a huge contribution from the valence of uh, the conduction band the parabolic band you see that the 3d bands also contributing to the conduction at least partially therefore these 3d electrons are separated in terms of up and down similarly the conduction electrons also are treated as up and down that is what you see here now what happens is at the fermi level the number of electrons or the density of states for the 3d electrons and for us for us electrons together it is not exactly same for the up spin and down spin whereas a non uh, unpolarized uh, band structure if you see that will be exactly same 
But now there is a difference and that actually that difference is what is giving rise to the magnetization because they are not exactly the same because the cancellation doesn't happen. Therefore, there is a net magnetic moment give, uh, given by this. That is what is shown here. Similarly, a spin polarization is actually defined in terms of the difference, essentially the difference in the density of states at the Fermi level for the upspin uh, band and the downspin band. That is what is shown here. And that is taken in terms of percentage that gives you the percent. So if you have a 100% spin polarization, that means I have only one type of electrons at the Fermi level. And so I can actually even think in terms of a current, which is purely a spin current in the sense that, okay, in this particular case, all the charges which are moving are of the spin up or spin down category. You can mention that. So that's the meaning of telling that the spin polarization is 100%. Otherwise, what happens is that you will end up with uh, polarizations which are smaller. So why you are interested in 100% spin polarization? Because you are looking for spin polarized currents. They have their own advantages as we are going to see. So understand this uh, very uh, important difference in the sense that when you are talking about metallic systems, you cannot have individual localized picture. You should have a band picture. In fact, strictly speaking, this is known as uh, an itinerant picture. Itinerant means it is not completely localized. At the same time, it's not like as conduction electron, it's in between. So that gives rise to the finite width of these bands. And these bands are giving rise to the displaced bands will give rise to different density of substrates at the Fermi level for the upspin and downspin. And that is what is giving rise to this magnetization here or the spin polarization here. So spin polarization is going to be the crucial parameter as far as we are concerned when we discuss spintronics. Now let me give you some idea about why we talk about spintronics. What is the need of spintronics? So this is a very historically uh, known thing that is uh, magnetic recording it, it really involves writing some information, some data and reading it. Both are needed otherwise it is not useful. So usually what is done is you magnetize it. So the local magnetization becomes the data recorded and one, one has to read it. A very conventional old style of reading is something like this. So there is as it, this coil moves through this. It actually gives rise to an induced EMF. That is what is the, uh, coming as a signal current that is taken. This is essentially Faraday's law. That is what is taken as this one. As you know, these are several limitations. First of all, this movement is, uh, has to be very, very perfect. And the sensitivity of this is not very good because this, as you can see, that there are gaps here and it can actually give rise to so much of noise and so on. So this is the one thing which was used for, of course, several decades uh, uh, we have used this, but it has got its own problems. Another very important problem associated with this, you see, if this uh, data that is written here, of course, it takes some small space of the magnetic medium. If the medium size is made smaller and smaller, you can do that. That is the only way of actually increasing the recording density. That is what is needed because we always want smaller and smaller devices. But the problem is then your sensitivity will be even more compromised because you are actually trying to get the signal and when the data becomes so close or the regions where the data is written becomes so closer and closer, naturally your detection becomes poor and poorer, the noise will get into the, uh, the recorded or the retrieved signal. Therefore, you will not be very, very, and the data will not be very reliable. So the reading becomes very unreliable. This is something which you don't like. So what happened is in the last uh, 20 years or so, things have changed. So you have, of course, the magnetic thin film uh, recording medium has become a very I mean, big, big revolution to so to say. So there are two ways of doing this. One is what is known as a parallel recording. This you can see that the magnetic moments up and down, they are written. They are actually the data that is stored one and zeros kind of thing. So you can see that this magnetization direction that is arrows are in the plane of the film. This is a part of the play, uh, film that is shown here. One can also have this perpendicular recording where you can see that it is up and down here. This is actually in the same plane. This is opposite, I mean, perpendicular to that. So this is, there are ways of reducing it. And one can actually see 